This is really intended to be a practical talk. Um, we're gonna do this in a guideline-based way, but I'm going to interpret the guidelines for you and hopefully give you an algorithm that can help you move through priapism quickly and definitively and give you some tools to maybe recruit people around you to help with priapism. Uh, these are my disclosures and they're not gonna impact anything I tell you today. This is our patient. I like to start most of these talks with uh, our classic patient. Um, What's most classic about this gentleman is the duration with which he's had priapism. Uh, I never get to see these guys unless I'm the one that created the priapism in my office. I typically don't get to see them for about a week. And they're usually humiliated, embarrassed, worried, scared, and they don't get treatment. Or they've been turfed from one ER to the next and finally they wind up with us. Um, and so as we talk about this patient, these are the things that we are gonna cover. And I wanna highlight that while the guidelines, and I encourage you all to read the guidelines, I think we may even have an author of the guidelines here in the audience. Um, uh, we're only gonna talk about ischemic priapism. And it's not that I don't care about stuttering or high flow priapism, it's just that those are controlled things. We can slow those down and treat them separately. So let's talk about ischemic priapism. You all know the definition, so I won't harp on it, but I would, in my life, and judging from the laughter, you know, this is a diagnosis that when you get the call, you're just like, oh, man. You know that it's gonna be time intensive. You know you could be in the ER for hours. Um, if you're just backing up somebody else, you know that it's gonna be an involved session. And so, as the bane of our existence, I wanna give you some practical things that you can do to make this easier. This is not for us to walk through, but I put it in my slide deck. I hope that you get my slide deck as part of the seminar. If you don't, come ask me and I will email it to you, I will give it to you. But if you needed to walk through the guideline, you could walk through this flow chart. But really what we need to do with any patient is get a history. Um, we need to do a physical and we need to do some basic laboratory tests. The, the synchronon of these men is how they came about, having an erection that lasted too long, and they are in pain. When you go and visit them in their gurney in the emergency room, they are typically writhing in pain. But even if you are 100% certain that this is an ischemic priapism event based upon their history and their physical exam, please, please document it by doing some basic testing. Do a laboratory assessment, get a penile blood gas, make sure it's in their medical record that they have ischemic priapism. Why are they in pain? They're in pain because their penis is dying. Their tissue in the penis is dying. This is a compartment syndrome. This, we know from histologic studies over time, the longer that they have this compartment syndrome of the penis, their tissue in the penis is dying. And so our patient, who's been up for four days, we know that he's gonna have thrombosis, necrosis, and importantly, this is gonna lead him to his most critical sequelae, which is erectile dysfunction or loss of normal sexual function. And so the moment that either one of my trainees or I enters the ER to talk to this patient about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it, I immediately provide some informed consent that not only, it's not the treatments that are gonna to lead to this sequelae, it's the disease. And I think it's absolutely critical for all of us, all of you, to make sure we have that. I've learned through, uh, we did a survey study a few years back of ER residency directors and some local ERs, and it turns out that ER doctors would love to treat more priapism. That's actually true, and I'm gonna give you some tools to recruit them at the end. Um, but they often ask me, you know, hey, I hear you instructing your team to get informed consent. How should I do this? And so this is what I tell them they should tell their patients when they do an informed consent as ER docs. And I pass this on to you. But the acronym that I'd like you just to remember is PAIN, P-A-I-I-N, which stands for penile block, aspiration, irrigation, injection, and neutralize. Why neutralize? Well, I, I needed an N for this acronym to work. And, but the idea here is that I wanna give you a trick that when you've done it, you know that you're done with treatment, that you've done everything you can do. 
When you get the call, there are some things that you could have people start assembling for you. There are things that the ER team can do, or there are things that your team can do. But I know that it's about 20 minutes from my home to the emergency room, and I won't, when I'm there, I'm all business. I want to be a urologist when I'm there. I don't know where these things are. So I keep this list. I give it to the ER staff. They, they have it. Uh, we have such a large priapism problem in my neck of the goods. We actually have a priapism team, and they keep a cart available for us. But these are the things, and these are the things that I would emphasize you should make a list of. First, penile block. Uh, you know, these guys are in agony, and help them, or help yourself by helping them to feel more comfortable. It buys you time and allows you to affect treatment easily. Uh, I, I didn't want to have any trademarks, so I had my kids draw some cartoons of anatomy for us. But this is a dorsal penile block. Do this, but this can't be it. A dorsal penile block will not set up for you right away. So give a dorsal penile block, but then also give some local anesthetic to exactly where you're going to be working, whether it's a ring block or uh, if you know that you're headed for a distal corporal glandular shunt, it's okay to localize the glands. So do that right away but stop the patient from writhing in the bed and buy yourself some time. Aspiration. There's some evidence in the medical literature that just taking some space out of the erectile bodies will uh, provide some therapeutic benefit. For this man who's been up for four days, it's certainly not gonna be enough, but this will be our opportunity to get a blood gas. So get the blood gas, send it off, it's part of your kit. I have this cartoon up for another reason which is every once in a while I'll have a resident or a fellow challenge me on, you know, why are you, you're gonna get more of a bruise if you pierce the penis from the lateral aspect at the base. Well, I don't really care about the bruise. I want my job to be easy. I want my job to be easy. I want your job to be easy. So when you're aspirating, do it at the easy spot, which is the lateral base. And these cartoons just sort of demonstrate Corporal irrigation, there's also some evidence in the literature and it makes its way into the guidelines. This is the idea of, you know, sort of irrigating out this clot, breaking up the clot, putting some saline solution through the penis. I would never actually do this. I don't have the privilege of really seeing uh, cases that would respond to this, but it remains in the guidelines. Um, and so for us, we're gonna bypass this and every single patient every single patient is going to receive some sort of sympathomimetic injection. Whether I've caused the priapism in my office or it's this guy who's been up for four days. Why? Because it can be effective and I don't know how good of a historian he is, so I want to give him this, this trial. You have to do this safe way, safely, so this is my recipe. Um, and I encourage you to have your recipe. It doesn't have to be the same as mine, but this is my recipe, and it is, the it is the rule of law in our institution. You use Walsh's recipe, which is I, the phenylephrine comes in a 10 milligram vial. If you injected that into somebody, you would kill them. So you draw it up into a 10 cc control syringe. I dilute it to 10 full cc's, so now I've got a one milligram per milliliter solution, and I discharge half of it. I just waste it and I draw up again to 10 cc's. Now I have a 500 microgram per milliliter solution of phenylephrine in a control syringe. Why is it called a control syringe? Because I can easily control it. And now I've got something where I've got one hand free and I can be working with my other hand. And this is a safe injection method for even patients with a cardiac history. So these things have failed and what are we gonna do now? And at our institution and in my book, and what I learned from my mentor, Tom Liu, is we are going to do a T-shunt. We're either gonna do it at the bedside or we're gonna do it in the OR, depending upon the state of affairs. Um, and as the guidelines would suggest, we want to do, to do this distal corporal glandular shunt. And I choose the T-shunt because I believe it to be definitive. If priapism persists, once I do that T-shunt, we're gonna do tunneling which is effectively gonna convert a distal shunt to a proximal shunt in my book. And one thing I do wanna really draw out of the guidelines is this idea that there is not good evidence for doing a proximal shunt. So when I was a resident, we'd have patients up in stirrups, we'd be doing these quackle shunts. Um, 
you don't need to do that. I don't believe you should do that. Wonderful cartoons from BJU International. This is uh, Maurice Garcia and another author, Dr. Will Brandt, who's in the audience, um, just showing the anatomy, the idea that we get perfusion from the posterior of the corpora, the corpora cavernosa are clotted off. What we really need is to get to something that allows egress of blood if you're so lucky to have the tissue allow for that, um, but breaks up that clot all the way down. This is the Tisha, and again, uh, uh, excellent artistry from BJU. This is a 10-blade scalpel going parallel to the urethra into the distal corpora. Please wear goggles and a gown because the blood will hit the roof. Um, it goes in parallel, and it doesn't matter whether the blade is facing up or down, but rotate it 90 degrees away from the urethra and pull it out and stand back. I repeat that on both sides. And then for me, because we see the worst of the worst priapism, we're always going to have a seven millimeter, seven millimeter Euromix or Hagar or Mentor dilator. And I know it's really scary to put this into the penis from the tip, but I promise you it's incredibly safe, incredibly safe. So hopefully with this, you've neutralized the priapism. So this is a lot of work. Um, it provokes a lot of anxiety. Um, how do we make this easier? Well, I think we do it by having the people who help us treat priapism be adept at this. And so we have a simulation protocol, simulation training module at the University of Washington. And I wanna share it with you and I, I wanna encourage you to recruit others to make your job easier. Um, one night I was at home after treating priapism and I was thinking, oh my God, this is exhausting. I really need the residents, the fellows to be more comfortable with this. And it came to me that all I needed was some hot dogs and red vines and I was gonna make the best simulator around. Um, and so we created this simulator. I'm gonna show it to you in a second. It's easily reproducible. You could use it with the residents you work with, the fellows, the physician assistants, the ER docs, the ER residents, uh, depending upon which amount of control you're willing to give up. Uh, you can see how happy I am here. I have a bucket full of hot dogs and a bag of red vines. And I'm about to, this is a Saturday afternoon, teaching the residents how to treat priapism. This is what the simulator, this low fidelity task simulator looks like, um, but it's all there. It's all the anatomic relationships. Um, here I am demonstrating exactly how we pierce the distal corpora, how we rotate, how I'm not afraid of the urethra, and how I put a Euromix diet later down without perforating the corpora. We uh, did a quick pilot study. Uh, this is published in the MedEd portal, this whole curriculum for any of you who want it. Um, and the bottom line is, is we improve their confidence, their ability to treat independently. Um, and we really increase the pace with which we were treating priapism. And pace matters. And their intellectual scores, their cognitive test scores improved as well. So, just to summarize for you, I think ischemic priapism is an emergency, it's a compartment syndrome. You need prompt evaluation and treatment. I'm hopeful that maybe some of the tools I gave you today allow you to do that. I discuss and document erectile dysfunction sequelae with every single priapism patient, every time, because otherwise they're gonna think I did it to them. Remember the PAIN acronym, and then consider recruiting people to help you with this disease and, and use this simulator which is available at a supermarket near you.